I'm Tommy Davis. I'm an associate professor to be. Um, I specialize in modernism and problems of aesthetics and politics, but I have additional interest in critical theory, human rights, and contemporary global Anglophone literature. Um, I don't think there is you know, one fundamental book or author that English majors should be required to read. Right? Um, as a modernist, I feel kind of like it's my duty to tell you to read Wolf or Joyce or Gene Toomer, um, but I don't really think that's the case. I think in some ways you want to read something that unsettles you and makes you think what it actually means to read and engage with the work of literature. Maybe that is a Virginia Woolf novel, maybe not. Um, and when I thought about this question, I actually went back through my mind and thought, well, what do I actually tell students when they ask me? And the book that came up over and over again was W.G. Sebald's Austerlitz. And it's an extraordinarily demanding book. Um, it has these long, meandering sentences, this fascinating and bizarre archive of photographs and other visual ephemera. It works by way of patterns and recursive imagery instead of a developmental plot. Um, but it's, I don't know, I think it's probably the most profound meditation on collective memory and historical violence. And I realize we're just coming out of the polar vortex, and that's sort of heavy material for summer <laughs> reading. So if that doesn't really float your boat, and you're going to the beach, the absolutely required novel should be Colson Whitehead's uh, Sag Harbor. All right. Did you want to say like a, an album that everyone should listen to, or? <laughs> oh, a required record? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need to listen to Black Flag, My War. So we just had our award ceremony last night, right, for the English department. And in the context of everyone's achievements, it's sort of hard to think of our students as slackers. Um, so I'm going to think more about professors, maybe, than students. Um, but I, I think there are a couple of things. One, I think, as professors, we want to design reading lists and problems and projects to make our students better writers and thinkers and readers, and we want those tasks to be very rigorous and demanding, I think. Um, but we also have to realize that our students have lives. Right? Many of them have full-time jobs that they hold down so they can come to college. Many of them already have families. And there's other things going on. And I think that's something we have to, have to be aware of and to some degree have um, a recognition that their success is, depends on those things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so as a professor, I think we have to find some balance between intellectual rigor and the real lives that our, that our students have. So the other thing is to instill a virtue of patience, right? Um, the assignments that we give and the projects we want our students to do require, ideally, that they will read, think about what they've read, write about it, and then do it all over again. Um, and the task, I think, isn't to read a novel that's due on Thursday, or to survive 50 pages of Spivak or Adorno. I mean, those are admirable things. Um, but somewhere along the way, we have to train our students to inhabit the world of a thinker or a writer and emerge from it with new questions and insights. And that's a very difficult thing. Um, the third thing, and this is very banal, but as an instructor, I have to sort of remind myself to treat student work with the patience that I ask them to have for their assignments, right? So that I'm giving their writing the due that it deserves, I'm giving them the best comments I can to make them better writers, to make them see um, how they're thinking, how they're forming arguments. And, um, but these, I mean, these are the things that we as professors do and complain about all the time, right? Um, but it's also what makes the job, I think, a kind of endless challenge and in that way rewarding. So the, I guess the unromantic answer to this is that just in a moment of panic I applied to graduate school when I was in undergrad because I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, I guess the slightly longer answer is that around junior year, there were two things happening simultaneously, right? The first, I was involved in this underground music scene and people in their teens and twenties were writing records, putting out records, they were doing zines, and they were doing it all outside of the institutions that normally facilitate this. And I find, found that DIY ethos very appealing. Um, and the part of it that I was interested in was very political. So somehow, 
these kids thought that you could write songs and put out records and raise awareness and have a real impact on things like immigrant rights, anti-imperialism, queer politics. And as I was thinking about that and trying to imagine how cultural production could have a political effect, I was being introduced to writers like James Joyce, W.B. Yeats, and Virginia Woolf. And to my professor's credit, they didn't raise these figures up as sort of transcendent icons of literary value, right? They plotted them within their historical worlds. And they challenge us to think to think about the form of, say, Mrs. Dalloway or the form of Ulysses, and to think how those those novels, in one way or another, were concerned with pushing against, for Joyce, the problems of empire, um, for Wolf, the force of sexual and gender norms. And you know, I, I thought that was very fascinating, and it was interesting, but it led to sort of a simple but very difficult question, right? Just if you want to challenge or interrogate social values or political systems, why write novels or poems? Right? It seems so strange. It seems strange to me now. Why would anybody do that? Um, but there's something about that question that made me care about literature. <laughs> Unemployed. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I. I got bit by the travel bug when I was in undergrad and had this insatiable wanderlust. So I thought for a while, very briefly, um, about hitching my wagon to the Peace Corps or some group like that that would send me to some place outside of the U.S. and ask me to do something, right? Um, so that seems like it might have been feasible. I don't have any marketable skills. Right? I have a lot of interest, but none of them are going to support me or pay my rent. Um, the only other thing would maybe open a record store and stay in South Carolina, and that just seems apocalyptic. <laughs> I think, ideally, I would like to be able to generate 20 pages of writing out of only reading 500 pages, right? Mm -hmm. Writing 20 pages takes a lot of work and a lot of reading. Um, but I think I'm more attracted to the writing process, right? Um, there's something so unpredictable and scattered, and at least for me, manic about writing. It has its anxieties and surprises, its incredible frustrations and its discoveries, and you can't really control it. Um, and even in moments of sort of impending doom, right, and <laughs> failure, there's still something pleasurable pleasurable about all of that. Um, and if you do it right, at the end of the day, you have something tangible to show for it. And that's pretty rewarding. Mm -hmm. This is easy. Um, <laughs> in August 1997, I was in a van with nine other guys, and we broke down in a Walmart parking lot in Texarkana. And it was hot. It was ugly. It was Walmart. <laughs> in some modern version of the Inferno, I'm sure that's a ring of hell, and I never want to go back there. I, there are two ways to answer this, I think, right? The first, I'll echo what my colleagues have said, you know, and that's OSU's largeness is a great attribute. And it seems astonishing to me that as an undergraduate, you could take courses in South African history, climate science, and the history of geopolitics. That then gets supplemented with the amazing range of writers and filmmakers and thinkers that flow in and out of OSU on an almost daily basis. Um, and then the travel abroad opportunities, right? Whether you're going with the Greenwich program or literary locations in our department, or you're going to Brazil or India. Um, it seems to me if you do it right at OSU, your time here can be really transformative. The other way to answer this is, I think for me, maybe a little more honest, and that's simply that I'm more impressed with students that don't rest on the fact that OSU is the greatest place ever, but they're more, cons they're more concerned about what OSU could be, right? And I think about a lot of the student organizations and groups in the last couple of years that have done events like the um, Occupy the Oval group, um, the uh, groups that work tirelessly to get OSU to divest from sweatshop labor, and all of the other groups that come up with spaces so that we can think about um, student debt or the value of public education or the question of Palestine, right? I mean, these are energetic and restless students who I think as professors, we should see them as a model of what the university could be and what it is when it's doing its best work. <laughs>